This is St. George, the capital of Grenada, a beautiful island nation with a very intriguing history. First inhabited by the Arawaks and then the Caribs. It was eventually settled by the French and then by the British. Grenada is known as the Spice Island, with nutmeg and maize being one of its major exports. In the 18th century, this spice had more value than gold. Today we make it the national dish of Grenada which is oil down, a very unique calabash soup, and a plantain crusted tuna. Today, as in the 18th century, nutmeg is a taste of history. First colonized by the French and then the British, the islands of Grenada still retain traces of these European influences on their culture. When Christopher Columbus discovered Grenada in 1498, he did not attempt to occupy it. He did, however, name this island Concepcion, and it remained uncolonized for another 150 years. Most likely, the Spaniards renamed the island Grenada because it reminded them of Spain. Island Caribs put up a really strong fight against the Spanish in the sense that even though they wanted to trade with them because they wanted the metal and the rum and the different things that the Europeans had to offer, they weren't willing to give ground. There were actually cases where the Island Caribs would attack Spanish ships and were able to even take the ships. With British and French expansion and colonization, each tried to take Grenada in the early 1600s, but the Caribs successfully defended their island. In 1650, the French landed and initially made friendly contact. When they tried to extend their influence to the whole island, the Caribs resisted and a number of battles ensued. The Caribs were finally overthrown by the French in 1652. Those who weren't killed in the battle jumped off the edge of the island to certain death, rather than live under occupation. The spot where they jumped was known as Leaper's Hill. Grenada, in a sense, represented that last hole because of where the island was located. It was basically the gateway to the South American continent where the Caribs traded and raided. Uh, so it really represented the last stronghold they had, and when Grenada fell, the rest were like dominoes. During the 18th century, Grenada's economy underwent an important transition. Like much of the West Indies, it was originally settled to cultivate sugar. However, natural disasters paved the way for the introduction of other crops. So these are damson. And our damson is yellow when it's ripe, almost the size of grapes. You have one pips inside, and it's very acid but you make jam with it. You can also make juice with it as well, and the leaves can be used for sore throat. That's noni, and you make juice with the noni, or you can buy it in the health shop, or if you have the tree, you can ferment it for yourself. And you drink about a teaspoon per day, and it helps with cancer, arthritis, diabetes, because it detox you. It smells bad, but it's very healthy. Nutmeg, baby, it's gorgeous. It must split before you can use it. And then after the yellow part, you get the mace. Mace, when drank wrongly, can be used as seasoning for seafood. They also use it in cosmetics and different salami as preservative. When you remove mace, you get the shell. That's what makes the pot. And when you crack it, you have the nut inside. And that's what you grate in ice cream, eggnog, rum punch, rice pudding, custard, etc. There is dispute over how the nutmeg tree actually came to be in Grenada. But since Grenada was a closer source of spices for Europe than the Dutch East Indies, the island assumed a new importance to European traders. Grenada is still known today as the Spice Island. Those of you who watched my show for years 
No, I cook with nutmeg almost every single recipe. Nutmeg? We don't do much without nutmeg. Nutmeg? It would never work without nutmeg. Well, guess what? I am in the capital of nutmeg, right here in Canada. So 200 years of history, right here we make the national dish of Canada, which is oil down. Oil down comes from the plantation days. It was a means of feeding a large group of persons economically. We're going to start first with the breadfruit, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, show me. We'll cut it. Before you take the skin off, you got to take all the guts. So the skin holds, this is rough, Hold, so yeah, this way rough. you can cut yeah. it up so you yeah. don't cut your fingers. Then you peel it. You know, I love breadfruit in, in any form you can get it. I mean, it's, to me, it's just fantastic. While I'm peeling it, just wash it out and I pack it in the pot. In the pot. Next come the figs. You have to cut it, go down. You can't cut it too deep. If you go too deep... it fall apart, right? It'll fall apart. And then you break it. You tell like a scrape out. But if you leave it after a while, you get black. So it oxidizes? Yeah. So you scrape the outside? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You stay in the water because otherwise they have this color until yeah, you put them in there. You put lime too, you know. To lime juice, yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Next, so you put the, the figs in there, lay them in there. Mm -hmm. No specific way, just throw it in, right? Yeah, it could go all over. What's next? I usually put some kalalu in the bottom okay. with some seasoning. And you told me that your mom made those packages for you this morning. Yep. Tell us thank you for me, will you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Naturally, just like bush, bush seasoning from the bush. Yep. Yeah. Before I put it in the pot, I'm washing it out. Mm -hmm. First, after. I'm amazing. It's because it's not hot houses, it's from the bush. Everything. And you just put it in there, spread it all around. The scallion, wash, wash it up. This up. Okay. I'm getting ready to eat it already. The flavor it comes right out between the herbs and the, the green onion. I can see how this comes together. I have to put the meat. And the meat you already pre marinated, right? Yeah. I don't want the chicken to go on the side here. When, when, when the food cook now, the chicken will burn. The breadfruit is like yeah. the base. The breadfruit is so like because it goes on the fire, it doesn't yeah. burn. So because yeah. basically you don't steal it, correct? Yeah, right. I got you. So it's kind of like a one pot, one pot meal slowly cooks all together. Yeah. Got you. Now, any protein would work in there, right? You don't have to use chicken. You can use no, what? No, no, no. I, usually, I usually use uh, iguana, maniku, sometimes monkey, and fish. Now, the next thing I'm doing now, I cover and back the meat again with some color. Okay, right now I'm breaking the coconut. Eh? Right. Yeah, perfect. Now that the coconut is peeled, you're going to take it on the grater. The saffron. This is what gives the part the, the, kind of the green color. Right, yellow now, but when the food cook, come mm -hmm. out green. I grate in the saffron over it because we need the saffron to give the pot the kind of flavor, flavor. and the color. Liquefy that and strain it. Tommy, here's your water. Yeah. Oh, help me out, pour some. Pour it in? Oh, yeah. I have to squeeze this now. Oh. You want to get the milk out oh. and then you're trying to get the discolorization from the turmeric. I got right, you. Yeah. So are you ready to put a pot on the fire now, yeah, right? Yeah. So here we go. All right. You couldn't find a lighter yeah. pot in there? <laughs> Careful there. Eh? Gently. Okay. All right, a little bit more water in there. I have to cover the pot now. Then after I cover it, right, knead the flour and put the flour over here. Got gotcha. you. So I'll cover it for a while. All purpose flour and water and kneading it into a dumpling. And again, depends how many people you gotta feed, more dumpling, less dumpling, right? Yep. Now I finish the flour and usually when the flour finish need, the pot does be boiling. Oh wow, nice. Usually what I do, I don't cut all the pumpkin skin because when you're eating it now the skin kinda of nice. You right? Just check the check the gut out. Yeah, so you have about four or five different layers of things in it. Now I put in some more kalalu. The kalalu also has a lot of water, so you don't need to add any more water into it. So in the end, it's, the dish is relatively dry, right? Yeah. 
So tell me, what's next now? Right now, putting the salvage in the pot now. When everything else is in it, then the pot just got to yeah. simmer for then. 30, 40 minutes to be all ready? Yeah. Now, when you use saltfish, you want to make sure you have no bones in there. Yeah. There's a beautiful quality saltfish you got here. But you have to pack it very neat, because it's easy to mash up. You have to put it last. And all we need now is push up the wood a little bit, get more heat into it, and yeah. done. Notice, no salt in this recipe, because the saltfish has enough uh, salt in it, and all the flavors cook together in harmony. Not to forget the spinners. The spinners add a little bit of texture to it, and also fills up your belly. Wow! Fantastic, look at that, all beautiful layered. We have not moved anything like that. The liquid has reduced down, the flavors come just out of there. So I'm dying to really try that, Taman. Right, one side of the pot to take food out, mm -hmm. right? So all over the pot have everything. So you don't need to search. Oh. Spectacular, absolutely spectacular. Nearly every recipe that dates back to the 18th century has what? Nutmeg. You know, nutmeg is used in, so, in, in everything. In a traditional Caribbean home, it's thrown into everything to give it flavor. There's a reason for the popularity of nutmeg in colonial cookery. As early as the 16th century, nutmeg was prized due to its medicinal properties. Said to cure the plague and the common cold, people carried nutmeg on their person to keep them safe from all ills. This made a small bag of nutmegs more valuable than gold. So it was no wonder that this spice became one of the most enduring spices of all time. Nutmeg has that unique ability to produce two spices, mace and nutmeg. These two spices are the country's principal exports, and farmers like Mr. Sinclair help to keep this tradition alive. Nutmeg is a thing that bears in Grenada quite well. Good drainage, has the proper climate, soil condition. Yes, plenty of rain. So it does perfect for nutmeg. So Mr. Sinclair, what goes on in here? Well, as you could see, we um, gathered the nutmeg from the field. We took the mace off of the nutmeg, like that. This is always done by hand, right? Not by hand, yeah. yes. Everybody do it the same in Grenada. Nobody knows any better at the moment. We put the mace aside, dry it for a few days. They not make, they crack it and they dry it and they bag it up and then ship it off to wherever it's going. How long is the drying period over there? Approximately six weeks. When you plant a new tree, how long it takes for the tree to bear fruit? Five years, they started to bear fruit. Yeah. So five years of investment you have until the tree is mature enough to bear fruit? Yeah. Look at that. Can I get any closer to not make than that? It's a beautiful looking fruit. When you, oh, look, yes. when you look from far, you could think it's a peach tree. Yeah, yeah. And the leaves are similar, so it's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. I get to open one, actually. Look yeah. at that. So that, oh, isn't that beautiful? Yes. And it looks to me like every maze configuration is like different in design, isn't it beautiful? Right. Yes. I told the fellas, when they pick it off the trees, pick it off within the nutmeg on it. Don't pick the nutmeg out and leave the pad on the trees because the trees still will have to maintain the pad. Give it sap and take energy from yes, the tree. from the trees. So normally we just drop it pads on the ground and keep the nutmeg. It's really hard to imagine, Mr. Sinclair, and the audience, what it means to me to be here today in a real nutmeg farm. Well, it's nice having you around. No? I, I really, really it's appreciate pleasure, yes. I really appreciate yes. that because there are many ingredients that I use on the show, but yes. nothing more important and more defined and distinct as nutmeg. Yes. None. June, what a treat. I have here with me the senior executive sous chef of Sandals de Source in Grenada. And what are we making today? Tell me. We're making thyme infused calabasa soup with dumpling. You told me that this is one of the soups you first learned when you came here from the Philippines, right? Yes, yes. How it's many years ago? It started in 1993. Cool. So almost 21 years in the Caribbean. So in, you in now have the soup perfected. Yes. <laughs> so what can I do for you? Can I help you on anything? Basically, first thing, we're going to do some uh, chicken stock. I'm going to put the chicken trimmings in the pot I have in the fire. He's going to cut up a little mirepoix. Mirepoix is basically any root vegetable you like. Carrots, onions, celery, whatever you like. He's going to chop it up. I'm going to move this over to the fire. 
All right, so here our water is boiling. I'm with the chicken in there. And it's basically all the trimmings, the wings, the bones, just to make a really good stack. We're gonna put some uh, onions, peel the onions. All right. Seasoning pepper? Seasoning pepper also, because we doing a local soup. Scallion or green onion, it's great flavor. Garlic, I put some ginger also. Let me add this into the stock. We're not making a consomme, we're making a pureed soup. So basically it's not so important that if you want to make a consomme that you want to have the impurities taken off the, the stock. Here I'm going to add in all the ingredients you chopped up, the garlic, the ginger, look at that. The onion, we're all in there like so, beautiful. It's important to get the flavor into it because the pumpkin, while it has a lot of good flavor, it needs a little bit of body of the chicken stock. Yeah. Next, we're gonna peel the pumpkin. The smaller the dice you make, the faster you cook the soup and the easier to puree it as well. Okay, we're gonna need some ginger, mm -hmm. onions, garlic, thyme, some butter in it. Yeah, nice and hot. Nice and hot. I put the onion in first. Yeah, onions. Garlic, ginger, and the thyme. And I wanna make sure that it doesn't burn. I just want to saute it, pumpkin in. The chicken stock we started earlier, we're gonna to top it off. We're gonna season with uh, nutmeg, salt, and black pepper. Okay. All right, we're gonna put some salt, black pepper, nutmeg. The soup now is cooking. We're gonna reduce it down by half. We're waiting until the Caribbean pumpkin is disintegrated. In the meantime, right now, we're gonna make our apparai. We have our flour, and then we're gonna season some black pepper and um, salt. Now we add water into it, small amount to make a paste. Remember, you can always add, but you can never take away. A little bit more. Now, how you shape yours? Um, like a spinner or like Yeah, a, like a spinner, yeah. A spinner is what we call in Jamaica a dumpling, which is spinning by hand. We make them small. Like small, one, like. small ones, yeah, beautiful. You see me cook many Caribbean recipes where I use a dumpling or a spinner. Why? Because it becomes a natural binder. So beautiful, it cooks up and the, the flour kind of adds to the flavor of the soup. And now we're just going to tie it up with a little bit of coconut, coconut milk. milk. Good. Beautiful. And let me give you that here, come on. Make sure I get myself one of the spinner babies. A little bit more. Let me try that here. Mmm. Good. Very nice. Fantastic. Excellent. So simple. So, so simple. good, isn't it? Nice and healthy. Spectacular. Absolutely spectacular. What a, what a great combination of the flavors. Very nice. Excellent. Roy. Hey Walter, how are you? It's so good. I get a privilege to cook with the executive chef for Sandals Resorts. Besides, I know you for a long time. Don't fool me now. Uh, it all started with you, Walter. <laughs> it's a privilege cooking with you again. You know, though, being out in the woods and seeing actually a nutmeg plantation was the highlight of my culinary career. You heard it from Jake in there? Absolutely. You want to crack it? Absolutely. Oh, we we'll see. It. Now we're talking about really fresh. Now this is, look at it. Isn't it beautiful? Beautiful. So what's your plan now? Tell me the plan. I got some beautiful tuna here. I see them. I butcher one of those. Yep. All right. It's a beautiful tuna. Beautiful tuna, isn't it? Now this one you, you take skin off, right? Absolutely. I want to pan sear that off for a little bit and I want to serve that with uh, shadow bene. Which is like, if once you ever have shadow bene, reach it over to me. I mean, I smell over there. once you had it, you take any cilantro and throw it out. Why, why need cilantro when you have this? Well, nobody else has it. What's your plan on cutting it? Just make some two little fillets on both just sides? Just make two little yep. fillets on both sides, maybe cut it in half and then, you know, just pan sear it and serve it. Here's my melange of spices. Peppercorn? Peppercorn, a little allspice some nutmeg, some cinnamon. Let's season this baby up right now. And we did so we're gonna use nutmeg that you brought me, right? Spices that we need for that. So that's seasoned there, Walter. Now, Walter, the key to this is really just getting it seared. Yeah, you're gonna cost it quicker than done. Couple of minutes and we're good to go. Look at freshness, Walter. Yeah, I see it. 
Can't get fresher than that. No, perfect. You want to make him nice and medium rare. Mm. Got my fresh coconut here, Walter. I'm going to make me some nice fresh coconut milk. Then I'm just going to make my ronda. The pot is ready. All right, come shake that, Walter. Shake it up. Shake it like it's hot. Then. All right, that's good, Walter. It's going to be hot. Be careful. Yep. There we go. Cooking with fire here. Cooking with real fire there. A little tamarind. We got this baby in there. I'm going to get some garlic. And I got my first time, and you can't leave out a shot of burning. I'm going to kick it up a notch with some nutmeg there, Walter. Yeah. It's a seasoning pepper, seasoning pepper and onions. Onions. Just goes into the rundown. Straight into the rundown. The seasoning pepper is hard to come by. It's usually only found in the Eastern Caribbean. I don't know why. It looks like a scotch bonnet or like a habanero, but it's not. It just has the flavor, but not the heat. So if you want something that is hot and spicy, you have to find another source. But I'm going to make a nice little uh, plantain pancake, and obviously going to infuse some of the local flavors in there and kick it up a notch. So then what is 200? A little bit of the herbs of the island. And uh, obviously, we're going to use some uh, shallow benny again. We're going to use sure. some scallion, some thyme, salt and pepper. All right, I think I need to give you some tomatoes to put in that run down there, Walter. And then we're going to season that. Local herbs and spices here. We got some shallow and some thyme. A little bit of nutmeg, a little bit of allspice. We're making some nice little plantain pancake. Tomatoes for me. Here you go. Tomatoes for you. That's for the sauce. That goes in the rundown. A little bit of salt in the rundown and tomato. And then it's basically a little bit more simmer and it's done. Once his fritters get cooked up, it's a matter of plating up the dish and we're ready to eat. To really get that intense Chateaubriand flavor, a little bit of that to the end. All we need to do now is put the sauce all over that. The key to the sauce here, Walter, is the more the better. Oh, sure. So it absorbs the, the plantain exactly, pancake and the exactly, fish. Exactly. And the fish is undercooked anyway, so it's kind of perfect. Absolutely. You have to garnish with some rough lemons. And I tell you what, you haven't forgotten anything. If not, well, you've gotten better. Thank you, Walter. It's a pleasure working with you today. And thank you for coming to Grenada.